It's also the first time I've been accompanied by live music onto the stage, so thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed your lunch. I am your halftime show. This marks the middle of your conference. Um, as you can tell, Grumpy Cat is asking, is this over yet? We're just getting started. All right, so a little bit about myself. By the way, the, the second monitor is not working, FYI. You guys can get that. So uh, I'm here to tell you about formats. Um, content formats are driven by devices that we carry. And if you don't know, uh, the media theorist Marshall McLuhan, he coined the term, the medium is the message. Now, if you understand a little bit about what he's actually trying to say, it means that the different types of media, whether it be newspaper, radio, or television, they impact the type of content that we create for that device and that culture. And what we're seeing right now is, because we have all these devices in our hands, it is profoundly impacting the type of content we are willing to consume because those devices actually affect us and make certain types of content more interesting than not, depending on how you use it. What do we do? How do I know this stuff? Cheeseburger, our business model is advertising related. We help brands figure out what to actually tell our users, how to actually reach a new generation of people who are basically born and grown up on the internet. And these people behave very differently than those of us who did not grow up on the internet. They have a different sense of what is culture, how to actually interact. And there's a saying that if you give a camera to somebody who's over 30, they will take a picture of the world. If you give a camera to somebody who's under 30, they'll take a picture of themselves. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing, but that tells you about a generational gap. Now, this is the difference between a device and a format. A device is a piece of equipment, uh, a form factor, if you will, something that you uh, will carry around with you that conveys a piece of content. A format is something that lives inside that device. So ebooks is a format, Vine videos are a format, Instagrams are a format, iPhones are a device, uh, your, set, your laptop is a device, and so on. What we're trying to find is what I call a native format. A native format is something that is new, that has been invented for your specific device. So when we talk about, let's say, Vine videos, there are a native format for the mobile device. Until Vine videos came along, it was really difficult to watch a lot of videos on the phone because they were too long, they required too much of your attention. What a Vine video does is in six seconds, it conveys the beginning, the middle, and the end, and it does it over and over again in case you were paying attention to something else. So you're sitting on a bus, looking around, Vine video shows up, six seconds, piece of cake. Wildly popular because it takes advantage of the specific environmental and device-specific um, advantages of being on a mobile phone. Now, what's happening to the form number of formats because of the devices? It used to be that when you had a format, you had a bunch of uh, devices that were verticalized. So if you wanted to listen, you had radio and CDs. If you wanted to watch something, a video, you had TV or live theater. What happened now is that the form factor has made it so much more horizontal. So if you want to watch something, you could do it on a laptop. If you want to read something, you could also do it on a laptop. If you want to listen to something, you can also do it on a laptop. You can do everything on everything. So how do you then take advantage of the opportunities of the new devices if you can do everything? You need to figure out what is special for the device. You need to figure out what is different about how people use that device. Because just because you can do everything doesn't mean that everything will be successful. I ask this question to a lot of people and, and I get a very different answer back. What is your favorite television? Not what is your favorite TV show, but what of these devices do you watch to watch TV? And it's actually a double-edged sword because television isn't a format or a device. Television is like this thing in your mind that you want to watch, but you're not sure if it's Netflix or if it's uh, a DVD or if it's broadcast television or cable. People are confused now because they don't know what they should be doing on what device. And that's an opportunity for all of us. So let's talk about the influence of devices on the format. So why does your iPhone look the way it looks? Why is your phone the size that it is? It's because more than a decade ago, a bunch of people sat around a room and said, for making high definition video, we're gonna make the aspect ratio 16 by nine. 
right? Just that's a standard you adopted. There were many competing standards, and all of a sudden it was 16 by 9. And now all your phones have to be 16 by 9, right? And so the impact of form and devices are actually symbiotic. Um, now that things are 16 by 9, all of a sudden you've got cameras that actually film by 16 by 9. And then something else happened. Instagram came along and made square photos popular. Weird, right? And now everybody's like, well, geez, I don't know, do we make square, square phones? I mean, is that what an Instagram phone should look like? These are really healthy debates because what we're saying is we need to continuously evolve what we think about hardware and format so that they work better together. So, then let's look at the big picture. What is happening to people and how they consume content? What drives people's desire for this type of content? This is what media consumption looks like for an average individual in the developed world. There are 168 hours in a given week. We spend, of the 168 hours a week, 112 of it we spend awake. Now, as you can see, the chart is actually talking about fragmentation. It's talking about how many different types of media are consuming each one of those everyday hours. If you noticed, um, the, the chart ends at 2020, that's the forecast. If it continues to go to about 2040 at the given rate, we'll reach 112 hours. In other words, what they're saying is, in 2040, we will spend every second of our waking life looking at a screen of some sort, looking at media, as you are looking at our presentation right now every single minute. There's something really troubling about that. But what they don't account for is the fact that sometimes you do two things at the same time. For example, you'll have your TV on the background or working on your laptop in the foreground. And every time you see that increase in market, that's an opportunity. Every time you see fragmentation in the market, that is an opportunity for you. Because whoever used to hold the keys to the kingdom, whoever used to hold all the power in media, are now open to disruption. That when a new form factor comes along, it is for you to create a new native format to take advantage of the new device, of the new uh, opportunity that the audience is giving you in terms of what you can program for them. It was crazy to think in the 1980s where we stand today. And it is going to be crazy 30 years from now we're gonna, where we're going to be uh, in the future. What the market wants what people on the social web, people on the internet want is far more engaging, faster, eye-catching, more creative, more insightful, more detailed. But you can't do all of that. None of us can do all of that. No company in the world can do every single thing because what people demand are really different things for different moments. But you can't do everything for everybody. What we found is that real-time content, content that you create according to what is happening in the world right now, is one of the most popular and widely shared pieces of content out there. If you want to cut, and if you want to cut the noise and rise above it, if you want to figure out how you can get in front of that audience of people who are consuming media 24 seven and don't know really what to do, real time content is one of the best ways to do it. It's a fantastic tactic. The advantages of real time content is that it's, um, it's fragmentation, it's competition, uh, it is rising above that noise level. It is also very growth driven because so much more of our devices are connected, there's more opportunities to push real time content. So whatever's happening in the Olympics right now, whatever's happening in uh, Ukraine, but also whatever is happening in the little community that we live in about Hamburg or about media, those things really matter to people. That's why trending hashtags are so important because we all wanna know what is happening right now. But it also provides a lot of risk factors. You can put your foot in your mouth. You can take a lot of heat for saying the wrong thing at the right time. And it takes a lot of resources and experiences to do it right. Real-time content's hard because you're under a lot of time pressure to create that content. This is an example of Oreos, the cookie company in the United States. For a gay pride day uh, on Facebook, they posted this message to millions of their fans on Facebook. It was amazing timing and this team clearly has uh, prepped many of these pieces of content and they knew that they were going to piss off a lot of people. A lot of people were very happy by what they did. There was a lot of backlash on Facebook um, for people, uh, for Oreo sponsoring Gay Pride Day. 
And what was interesting about this was they were not afraid to make happy a small group of people, and actually in this case it was a majority of people, but they were, the backlash actually served a second purpose, which was it made Oreos seem more progressive. They took a significant risk by doing this, but they timed it correctly, they prepared for it, they did a great job of actually setting up their audience to talk about this issue. And it was one of the most um, interesting things in the conversation. And this post itself became real-time content because everybody wanted to talk about it because it was controversial. Now, I'm not saying you have to be controversial, but it certainly helps if you've prepared, if you've practiced, and if you understand the impact of technology. So, let me switch examples here uh, about what's happening to devices and formats in our, in our world. This is, let's say, a typical German living room. Okay. You've got a nice flat screen TV there. It's nice, but it's kind of small these days, don't you think? What's happening now is that you've got high definition TV and you've got ultra high def 4K television coming out. 4K is four times the resolution, yet your living room size doesn't actually change. You're not going to get a four times larger living room. I mean, you wish you could, but you're unfortunately going to have to put it in the same room. But that's okay. You're going to have a three and a half meter screen size if you want to see the difference between regular high def and ultra high def. You need a bigger screen to see all those details. And so this is what a average um, American HDTV looks like. It looks pretty good. If you actually had a three and a half meter television, this is everything that, that you would see. You do notice all the stuff around you. It's like sitting at home in front of IMAX television. You notice something that was missing? In that regular first high def image, there was a little house that was blowing up in the corner. If you actually move to the high, uh, ultra high def, it's gone. Why did that go away? Why is it that when the screen is bigger, there's less detail? It turns out that when you're sitting that close to a four, a three and a half meter TV, there's this thing called peripheral vision, and you, can actually, you cannot actually see the things in the corner of the TV. And so in order to actually adapt this for storytelling, you can't put a house, which is part of the plot, in the corner blowing up because no one would see it. You must now retell the story in a different way because our devices force us to think differently about the content. That's an example of how people have to start thinking small as well as big about adapting to native formats. Now, you can also do different things with this type of format. Uh, you can actually take Xbox One with its Kinect. It's watching you all the time. I don't know if anybody here has an Xbox One. Some of you, okay. It's really weird. If I walk in front of the TV, it'll say, hello, Ben. It'll recognize my face and it'll immediately greet me. My wife will walk in front, it'll say, hello, Emily. Your TV's watching you, okay? This is the future we live in now, already exists. So you can actually put four high def screens on one 4K television, and Xbox will know which one you're looking at. The problem with four screens on one TV isn't the video, it's the audio. You can't listen to four things at once, we can still only unitask with audio. So, the device can actually recognize which screen, which corner of the screen I'm looking at, and turn on the audio for that. So if I'm watching American football at two in the morning here in Germany, I can look at one corner of the screen and be like, wow, I can listen to just that one game. And if David Hasselhoff shows up on the other screen, I can look at the other screen, and all of a sudden, the audio from that channel will play. These are, if somebody was able to invent this for 4K television, this is a brand new opportunity to let people consume media in a native format that is new for the technology that's been created. So more formats forces evolution. We must continue to evolve our media, our ideas, our creatives, our advertising to fit this world. We must actually offer new experiences and you can also try adding real-time content in order to actually test that idea. And if you're creating social content for this audience, for this real-time audience who's always on the go, who's, who's trying to figure out how to actually figure out what they're trying to consume, um, let me give you an example. Um, in the United States, we had this thing called the government shutdown. I know it's kind of embarrassing. Um, we can't get along, so we turn off the lights and go home sometimes. That's our federal government. <sighs> um, so this congresswoman, one of our uh, effectively members of parliament, uh, decided that she didn't want a paycheck while she wasn't doing her job. 
Amazing, right? That's like pretty normal. Hey, I don't, I didn't go to work today, don't pay me. You actually have to, um, there's actually a law in the United States that says even if, if you work for the, if you're elected representative, even if you don't go to work, we have to pay you. Guess who passed that bill? Anyway, so what happens is she wrote a letter to the treasury saying, please don't pay me, I'm not at work. And this piece of content went viral. It's pretty awesome. Clearly real-time content, this, because this was when the government was shutting down. At the same time, Pokemon X and Y came on the market. Now you would think that those two things are completely unrelated, but this is where it gets really interesting. Pokemon X and Y. You would think Pokemon is for, who thinks Pokemon is for the kids? Almost everybody, right? Pokemon was released in 1996. The first generation of Pokemon players are now turning almost 30. Think about that. You have professionals among you who are playing Pokemon at home. <laughs> So we mashed it up. We had a fake Barack Obama posting saying, I'm shutting down the government so you can all go home and play Pokemon X and Y. This also went pretty viral. If you think about mashing up government shutdown with Pokemon, you would not know this unless you looked at the facts and the history and the data that said, you know, Pokemon players are, playing, are turning 30. They know what the government is. So what three lessons did I take away from that? You need to redefine your target category. Um, you may be pigeonholed into uh, business for men or, or marketing for women or whatever it is that your, your target demographic is. You need to redefine and think about what else are they doing because we have data and tactics and ways to reach people in more creative ways than ever before. And those new methods that you haven't discovered before might actually be cheaper and more effective at reaching the target demographic, but you must think outside the box, because outside the box is where we have actually made it easier to do so in order to reach your target demographic. Don't get stuck in your category. Start to think outside of your existing category and think how you can actually go flank around the corner to your target demographic. If you can use Pokemon to reach uh, professionals, you should do it. Break out. Consistency does not arrive from the absence of constraint. Constraint is the catalyst that frees us from our own restraints. One of the challenges of working with new formats is that a six second video on Vine is not a lot of time, right? What, what can you do in six seconds? It doesn't seem like you could do much, but Acura could run an advertisement in six seconds on Vine. In fact, most TV commercials are already 15 seconds. If you start to cut things out, if you th start to think serially, if you start to think about taking stories and putting it in six second chunks and doing five of them, then you can tell a 30 second story. You must embrace the constraint as a factor in creativity. And in fact, the more we realize the constraints exist, the better and more creative people become. The worst thing you can do is ask some, uh, someone uh, to be creative and then they will ask, well, what are my parameters? And you will say, there aren't any. And that's a recipe for disaster. The reverse of that is also true. If you give somebody specific constraints, they can be more creative than you could ever, ever imagine. Final lesson, create a feedback loop. This is very, very important. This is probably more important than the other two points. You must be willing to fail and learn. This is something that the Americans have done really well. We look like we're screwing up all the time, but what we're really doing is learning. At least that's what we tell ourselves, okay? We're really good at failing. In fact, there's an entire industry called startups that's designed to fail over and over again. And we learn from that experience. Because what we're doing is we're getting more feedback. And while people are trying and, and, and not knowing when to take risks, we are learning from those failures and getting that, getting that feedback and figuring out how to be better next time. Anyway, thank you very much for all your, all your attention.